We're going to get started in just a minute. We're letting people into the room, and then we will start in, in just a minute. We're just going to wait just a few more seconds, and then we'll get started. OK, well, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Rick Hassan of UCLA School of Law and the Safeguarding Democracy Project. And I'd like to welcome everyone to the latest installment of the Fall 2023 webinar series uh, for the Safeguarding Democracy Project. I want to thank Harley Hamm and Ben Austin DeCampo for their important logistical support today. And I want to tell you about some upcoming programs of the Safeguarding Democracy Project. All of these programs are free, but registration is required. On Tuesday, October 17th at 12.15 p.m. Pacific time, Genevieve Lackier and Eugene Volokh will join me in conversation on the Trump prosecutions, the First Amendment, and election interference. This event will be online, but also will be live at UCLA Law School. On Friday, October 20th at 9 a.m. Pacific time, SDP will hold a virtual conference on the law and politics of potentially disqualifying Donald Trump from running for president. We have an amazing lineup of speakers. Conference will run for about four hours from 9 to 1 p.m. Pacific time, 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Then on November 16th at noon Pacific time, Pam Fessler, retired from NPR, will be moderating a great panel called Covering the Risks to Elections on the State and Local Level, Views from the Beat Reporters. We'll hear from Jonathan Lai, Carrie Levine, Patrick Marley, and Yvonne Winget Sanchez. Links for all of these events are on the Safeguarding Democracy Project website, which is safeguardingdemocracyproject.org. Again, registration is required, uh, but it is free. Today's topic is the Roberts Court and American Democracy. And we're in for a treat that we have one of the leading Supreme Court reporters and Supreme Court justice biographers, my friend Joan Biskupic. Joan is a full time CNN analyst and author. Before joining CNN in 2016, Joan was an editor at large for legal affairs at Reuters and previously the Supreme Court correspondent for the Washington Post and USA Today. She was a finalist for the Pulitzer Prize in explanatory journalism in 2015. In addition to her biography of Chief Justice Roberts the Chief, she's the author of books on Sandra Day O'Connor, Anthony Scalia, and Sonia Sotomayor. A native of Chicago, she holds a law degree from Georgetown University and lives in Washington, D.C. Her newest book, which we'll be talking about and that I heartily recommend, is Nine Black Robes, Inside the Supreme Court's Drive to the Right and Its Historic Consequences. I'm going to uh, ask a series of questions, but you also can ask questions by uh, submitting them via the Q&A function on the Zoom box. I'll try to get to these near the end of our program. But first, let me welcome you, Joan. Uh, thanks for joining us today. Thanks, Rick, and thanks for holding up a copy of that book. <laughs> <laughs> I'll do it as many as many times as I can. As a book author, I know how valuable that is. You um, do, you do. Um, so I thought I would start, since this is um, a uh, program of uh, the Safeguarding Democracy Project, by asking you to talk a little bit about the relationship of the, between the Supreme Court and democracy, in particular, its trajectory on issues related to voting rights. And we could talk about other issues like campaign finance or, and uh, other democracy related issues down the line, but the Supreme Court specifically on voting rights from the Shelby County versus Holder case in 2013 to what we saw last year in uh, Allen versus Milligan, uh, which seemed to be maybe some pulling back. So I thought maybe just big picture, 30,000 feet, where is the Supreme Court on voting rights today? Sure. And I, I think I'd even start with one that's uh, related to voting rights, but more directly on to partisan gerrymanders. And a scene that I will never forget came in June of 2019. And until very recently, it was the last time we had a dissent from the bench. Uh, as all of our audience knows, 
from June of 2019 until just uh, this uh, this year, uh, the the justices were not uh, reading portions of their opinion and dissents from the bench. So uh, the last one we had was Rucho, uh, the partisan gerrymandering case, and uh, you know it's kind of adjacent to what you're talking about with with voting rights here, Rick. And it was a moment that I really felt uh, this five to four court, and it was a five to four court then, uh, had really engaged the idea of democracy and what democracy needs. And, you know, after Chief Justice John Roberts unspooled his opinion saying federal courts are not going to entertain these partisan gerrymandering cases, you know, this is this is just left to states and the political process. Uh, Justice Elena Kagan gave what was a, a pretty mournful dissent but there's, uh, there was a, a line in that that I always have rattling around in my head. And I actually looked it up uh, so that I did not uh, misstate it at all. And she said, of all times to abandon the court's duty to declare the law, this was not the one. The practices challenged in these cases imperil our system of government. And I think that really cuts to the core of the individual justices and their notion of how they should be protecting or, you know, you know, more at arm's length from democratic concerns. And uh, that, that has always struck me uh, at this moment in time, because now that was in 2019 and so much more has happened since then that I think it's just even more reinforcing of how much this Supreme Court can help safeguard democratic uh, ideals and preserve voting rights and the franchise overall. And sometimes it steps back. Now you mentioned Shelby County. You know, when I think I think of Shelby County as certainly a defining ruling of this court, and especially of Chief Justice John Roberts. That's the one that you know probably everyone in our audience remembers. 2013, again five to four in the before we got the current supermajority where the justices eviscerated uh, uh, the preclearance provision of the Voting Rights Act that required states and localities with a history of discrimination to uh, get Justice Department or special court approval of any change to their uh, electoral practices. And uh, the chief just really felt like it was a provision that had run its course. And I think that that's where the tension is uh, with the remaining liberals and now this very strong conservative supermajority that believes that uh, it can it is not it is not deciding these, but it's actually deciding a lot. It can't leave it just to the political process. And I would just say picking up from Shelby County in 2018, we had a pair of cases and one was um, the uh, uh, I think it was Perez, the Texas, the Texas uh, uh, VRA case there. Abbott, Abbott and versus a, Perez. Abbott versus Perez, exactly right. And then, of course, uh, Boinovich, the Arizona case in 2021, where we then had uh, the conservative supermajority rolling back some of the protections of Section 2. So, you know, I would say that this is a court that, uh, whether it likes it or not, is very much engaged in uh, questions of democracy. And I think that many times it steps back from being the protector and it thinks that it can leave it to others. But um, uh, what we've seen in the other branches is that uh, that kind of potential abdication does not help the situation. Uh, and we can talk about uh, Allen versus Milligan uh, if you wanna pick up from there or, or anything else. Really. The one other thing I would mention, I, th I think it was great that you referred to um, Citizens United, but I'm, I'll give the court one thing, a plus thing, uh, in an area that some conservatives have really wanted to pull back, and that's on um, uh, free press. Uh, we've seen Justice Thomas really be vigorously trying to uh, reassess the protections of New York Times versus Sullivan. And I would just say in one thing for the majority's favor in terms of projecting, protecting a robust process, press in our democracy uh, on Monday, uh, or let's see, are we in the, I'm trying to think if it was Monday or, or Tuesday, where they issued an order that rejected a, a, a challenge to New York Times versus Sullivan in the Don Blankenship case. So there are areas where conservatives uh, are not going that have to do with protections for democracy, but there are plenty of areas where they are rolling back 
certain safeguards. I do want to talk about the First Amendment a little bit later, uh, and also the sure. next case, case cases that the court agreed to take. But let, let's stick with voting rights uh, for a little bit. Um, so if you read Shelby County and you read Brnovich, uh, you see a court that is um, increasingly hostile to the Voting Rights Act. Uh, in Shelby County, the court essentially killed off the part of the Voting Rights Act that required jurisdictions with a history of race discrimination in voting uh, from having to get federal approval before they made changes in their voting rules, so-called preclearance. And in Section 2, this was the first time that the Supreme Court had to address the scope uh, in Brnovich, the scope of Section 2 outside the context of redistricting. And that was, I think, a very voter unfriendly decision. Justice Alito, who's probably the most hostile to voting rights, I think, on the, uh, the, the Voting Rights Act on the court right now, wrote an opinion that essentially rewrote Section 2 and made it very hard for plaintiffs to win. But then we got this pulling back last term. And so I want to drill down a little bit on two cases. One, you already mentioned Allen versus Milligan, the other Moore versus Harper. Just to give some background, Allen, the Supreme Court, um, uh, said that the lower court was right in requiring the drawing of a second majority black district in Alabama for a, a congressional district. This has national implications, of course. Um, but Chief Justice Roberts, who had said in 2013 in Shelby County that things had changed in the South, was pretty much saying things had not changed enough in the South yet. And uh, he was joined by Kavanaugh and the liberals on the court. And then in Moore versus Harper, uh, North Carolina Republican legislators advanced a very aggressive theory about uh, legislative power uh, over voting rules in congressional elections. And that theory was roundly rejected by the Supreme Court, although they did embrace a kind of weaker version of this independent state legislature theory. What do you think explains this, what I see as a shift or a stasis from the kind of steady march to the right that we had seen before the end of last term? I'm going to take them separately. And I, I have to say that before we got the ruling in uh, Allen versus Milligan, I thought for sure they would be cutting back on Section 2. And I knew, you know, the chief, just to remind folks, the chief did separate himself from his conservative brethren at the first in the first chapter of that case by saying that he thought uh, that they shouldn't stay the map that had provided um, to black majority districts. He had felt that the, the three judge panel had done its work exactly right and that Alabama should not use the map for the uh, 2022 elections uh, with only one black majority district. So the chief had uh, showed some of his hand there, but he did say that he was quarreling with the test for section two voter dilution cases. And one thing I said uh, when I wrote the book on the chief in 2019 is that if there's been one area of the law that he has been consistent from, from when he burst on the scene in the early 80s as a, a Ronald Reagan young lawyer, he has been consistently trying to uh, curtail the, the reach of the Voting Rights Act of 1965 and to give more authority to the states in this area. Um, so I did not expect such a robust ruling from him, but I think it's a one-off, and I'll tell you why. I, I think there were there were many factors that led to it. First of all, I would say Alabama. Alabama brought this on in a big way. Alabama's arguments were so aggressive. Alabama was essentially turning its back on precedent on Section Two, and it was uh, as the chief himself said, it it would. It was asking the Supreme Court to rewrite Section 2, to throw out its precedent. Uh, Justice Alito, if I'm remembering right from the oral arguments in the case more than a year ago, in fact, they were heard in October of 2022, tried to get the Alabama Solicitor General to take uh, a more modest approach you know, one that, you know, could preserve a map with only one black majority district, despite the fact that 27% of Alabama's population is African American. And, you know, arguably a second district would be exactly what was in order. But, you know, uh, the Alabama officials were pushing very, very hard. Uh, I think that they saw that this Supreme Court had put out a welcome mat on things like race and other, uh, conservative culture war ideological issues but the message from the court is we might be we might be moving toward a 
uh, more extreme position, but not that extreme, not that radical. I think that, so I think Alabama's very uh, sweeping arguments were part of it. I also think what was part of it was, you know, again, it was Alabama. You know, when we think of Alabama's history and how much they have dug in, Alabama, the site of Shelby County, Alabama, the site of, you know, the Edmund Pettus Bridge massacre that even led to the Voting Rights Act in 1965. Uh, I think it just it just pushed this court too far. And it came at a time when they already were going to roll back all of racial affirmative action. You know, I think that was that was one where the chief was not going to compromise on uh, that. That case had been building for years. The chief had laid out his position on that completely in the educational context, you know, the way to stop uh, discriminating on the basis of race, to stop discrimination on the basis of race. So we knew where he was going to go on that. And I think that there were a combination of factors where um, as that that produced this Alabama ruling. Now, uh, not only did I, you know, the, the vote was one thing, and I, and I can talk about Kavanaugh in a second because it was it was not a beta complete behind the scenes. That's for sure. Kavanaugh Kavanaugh took some time to persuade, but I have to say that the chief's opinion was not just it was not a begrudging affirmation of the district court panel. It was it it um, wholeheartedly embraced what the district court had found and. Just to remind everyone, I know you know this, Rick, that district court, court panel was not a, any kind of flaming lefty panel. It had two Trump appointees on it with um, with an appointee of Bill Clinton. So, you know, it was it was a panel that had heard, as the court wrote, you know, seven days of evidence uh, in a hearing uh, gone through thousands of pages of, of documents and and came up with that. And I think the chief, you know, he said that when he voted uh to let that uh, the the original map the the map by the three judge panel take effect, um, he had said, you know, look at they did everything right below, and I think that also fed into it. Uh, and I, and just to button up this one, the the Alabama case, uh, I I was uh, surprised at how uh, how generous his language was about Section Two, and because you and I know very well how back in the early 80s, he was not in favor of that compromise that became law in section two, but yet he lays it out like there was this happy compromise back in the, you know, 1982, I believe it was 82, over the reach of section two that, you know, uh, Ronald Reagan eagerly signed. Well, John Roberts was one of uh, working with then attorney general, uh, William French Smith trying to get Reagan not to sign on to that, but but you know whatever he's with it now, and he probably in part because he saw how far these states were pushing. So and then, but let me just as I say, button it up on the Kavanaugh part. You know, Brett Kavanaugh, as we know, had voted to let this the original the map take effect, the map with only one black majority district for the 2022 elections, which you know might have been decisive in the House of Representatives. It could have, you know, it, it would have just been one other piece that could have changed the uh, the ultimate GOP majority there. But uh, he, I think, I think he was convinced by the chief. And as I wrote in a bit of a postmortem deconstruction of the whole, reconstruction of the whole thing was that, you know, the chief and Kavanaugh spend a lot of time talking privately outside the conference of the nine justices. And uh, Kavanaugh ended up being convinced. And I felt like what Kavanaugh did not sign of the chief's opinion didn't matter. And obviously the three judge panel, when it went back in, didn't think it mattered. Now, down the road, uh, you know, he talked about, you know, maybe at some point section two will run its course in terms of uh, uh, race conscious redistricting. It had not run its course yet. Yeah, so let me stay on this before we turn to Moore versus Harper. Um, sure. So one of the things, Alabama, you talked about their recalcitrance. <laughs> they have a long Definitely. history of recalcitrance against voting yeah. rights going back um, to the early night, the early 1900s when they were, you know, the despite the 15th Amendment, they did not let blacks register to vote, leading to that infamous Giles case where the mm -hmm. Supreme Court said, nothing we can do about that. That's really a question for Alabama. Uh, but I'm, the recalcitrance of Alabama extended to this term. Case was remanded. Allen versus Milligan was remanded to the district court. District court said, you've got to draw 
uh, legislature got to draw a second majority minority district. And there was outright refusal from Alabama to do so. And the three judge court imposed a map. And then there were all of these rumors. Alabama goes to the Supreme Court on an, on the shadow docket, on the emergency docket and says, you know, we want to get this stopped. We don't think your opinion, I think, which literally said you must draw a majority minority district or something very close to it. Yeah. Um, uh, we don't, you know, we don't think that your opinion required us to do that. And there were all of these rumors circulating in uh, the Alabama press and in some conservative press that they had info that Kavanaugh was interested in um, uh, in making a change. And you know, my first instinct, and I told reporters this was, it's no way is this whatever Kavanaugh thinks about the Voting Rights Act that he's going to use this case where Alabama is being so. Uh, resistant to what the Supreme Court ordered to rethink uh, these issues down the line. I mean, do you think of Kavanaugh? And of course, that's what happened. The, the court, I think, with no dissents, just refused, no noted dissents, refused to hear the Alabama case again. Do you think Kavanaugh is an institutionalist? And in, in that way, is he different from the other Trump appointed, appointed justices, Barrett and Gorsuch? It depends on the case. Because I had been doing, at the time that Alabama was digging in in July and August was exactly when I was doing reporting on what had happened behind the scenes so they could understand what Kavanaugh did. And I I was convinced in talking to people who knew that Kavanaugh was not going to switch his vote. I was also aware of what was being reported in the local press. And it was because, I mean, those those local reporters had every reason in the world to speculate because you had the solicitor general and the attorney general suggesting to state legislators that they had some inside, quote, intelligence about what Kavanaugh would do. So I, I was actively running that down to see if there was any merit to it and zero, zero merit to it. And I, I felt that, you know, in part, uh, you've got a group of people in Alabama who might have engaged in some wishful thinking. Uh, they thought maybe they could dig in. I do not think I actually do not think any of Kavanaugh's colleagues would have ever directly suggested that Kavanaugh was going to switch, just from what I knew from inside, that nobody had been misled, you know, about what was going to happen in the future. Now, you know, it is the future. It's not like they're they're anticipating that that Alabama is going to completely turn its back on uh, the June the June decision. But uh, I, what I thought in terms of no note in dissents. I thought that if I, um, you know, if there might have been some sympathy to Alabama on the part of some of the original dissenters, let's just take Justices Thomas Gorsuch and Alito for the, the ones on the farthest right, they might have had some sympathy for Alabama. They might have thought some of their arguments on the second round uh, had some validity. But after Alabama was so public about how they thought they could game the court, I thought, I, I, I actually thought, we're going to get this is going to they're going to give us a quick order. And why would anybody dissent to give Alabama anything? And that's how it played out. Yeah, because one thing the justices can agree upon, despite their divisions, is that the they are, they are supreme. Uh, yes, they do not want to be gained. Yes. OK, so let's turn to Moore versus Harper. And let me put this in a little bit of a broader context, which is that the theory that was advanced in Moore versus Harper, this independent state legislature theory, at least the more extreme version, as was performed in that case, was very much in line with uh, an argument that Donald Trump was making after the 2020 election to try to overturn the results, saying that uh, state legislatures could come in and overturn the results of a presidential election, that the voters' votes are just advisory and legislatures are supreme. Uh, there was some language in Bush versus Gore that gave some support, but there was lots of historical evidence and other evidence against it. Uh, people were bracing for the worst. Uh, the court ends up in Moore versus Harper with, uh, I don't want to call it a split decision, but a compromise decision that, again, recognizes the Supreme Court as supreme and says that we can second guess state courts when they go really far out and um, uh, they kind of usurp the power of the legislature by uh, you know, totally disregarding of the language of a state constitution or, or a state statute. Uh, but but we're not going to say that they that legislatures can have free reign and and don't exist in their normal state content, uh, state um, sets of rules. So can you put this in context of with the with the earlier Trump rulings and, you know, with the, the role of the, the Trump justices? This, uh, again, Nine Black Robes is your first book 
that addresses the Trump justices, uh, you know, because well, your last books were before their arrival to the court. That's right. And I think that as much as uh, the three Trump justices feel some loyalty or gratitude toward uh, former President Trump, they uh, have signaled in many ways, we're not with him. You know, during, uh, you know, just to back up for during the campaign, dur I mean, during the 2020 election, you know, they didn't take up any of those crazy far-fetched cases, you know, they and and without without real dissent. You know, it, even that one, the final one from Texas, you know, when Justices Alito and Thomas uh, wrote separately, it had nothing to do with the validity of the arguments. You know, it was on a procedural matter. So, you know, they showed, you know, we are not going to get into this. And then with this case, what's interesting here is they had a major off ramp. You know, like Rick, was this case really one they needed to hear after North Carolina state courts con continued to grapple with it? There were a lot of questions about whether they had a final uh, ruling in front of them. You know, they could have easily, g given how this is a court that will happily take off ramps, I thought for sure there would be a majority that would say in the end, let's not do this. But Instead, the majority thought, if we're going to do this, we got to do this now, outside the context of election year. You know, that's that's where they came down. And then, unlike um, Allen versus Milligan, the Alabama one that was a narrow 5-4, this one was 6-3. Justice Barrett signed on also. And when you think about what's in, you know, the, two, the competing factions that signed this, uh, the one thing they could agree on was exactly what you said, that the Supreme Court is supreme. You know, so... I think that it uh, they they said a lot in that opinion, but they also left themselves lots of room. And I could see I could see, you know, litigation playing out in in myriad ways as we go on. I was just going back to look at the language. Uh, I'm, I'm updating my book you know, for the, um, the paperback edition is coming out later next year. And I had to decide what I wanted to what I wanted to include. And because I had, as you know, Rick, because you had you had read my chapter on Bush v. Gore and uh, Biden versus Trump, just kind of looking at, you know, the the worries that plenty of people had about whether this independent state legislature theory was going to have real legs, and I think you know they wanted to they wanted to both shut it down and say we're not going in any extreme here, but they wanted to leave some options open for later and. Um, I was going back and rereading exactly what John Roberts said about uh, what was in uh, uh, Bush v. Gore about the power of the state uh, state legislatures, and he he quotes from from uh, Rehnquist's opinion that you know I had been completely steeped in because that's where so much of it was voiced. But I had actually forgotten what David Souter had written, and I, you probably didn't. But he refers to the fact that David Souter had this you know alternative idea of you know state courts versus um, state legislatures. But then uh, the chief, Chief Justice John Roberts says, you know, we're not going to buy either of those and we're not going to resolve this now. Let's just say that we will still decide when state courts have gone too far. But for now, there is no uh, election clause exception to the fact that state judges interpreting their state constitutions are going to be the arbiters of state law. So I think, and, and you know how he is with Marbury versus Madison. If there's, a, if there's any reason to quote Marbury, Marbury versus Madison, the chief will take it. Yeah, I do think that, uh, you know, two aspects of it were particularly interesting to me. One was that Alito did not sign on to the uh, to either view of what the independent state legislature theory means. He dissented separately just on the question of whether the case was moot or properly mm -hmm. before the court. So I thought he was holding his his fire, even though in earlier shadow docket rulings, he had suggested that the, the more aggressive theory, the one that Gorsuch and Thomas embraced was the right one. And then the liberals on the court didn't write separately to, to push back on what was essentially dicta in the uh, opinion about um, you know, how the independent state legislature theory does work here. And it was dicta yeah. because, because the, um, the, the North Carolina legislators took a litigation strategy. They were saying, we're going to assume for purposes of our case that the North Carolina Supreme Court perfectly interpreted North Carolina law. We're just saying we don't have to follow it. And so 
uh, the liberals could have said something separately, like don't reach this issue now. And we don't like the test that you are putting forward, but they didn't do that. And I'm wondering if either, if you have any insight into why, or a like, more general view of what the strategy is of the liberal justices, you know, when they face, they can't just peel off one person anymore. Like they used to sometimes. No. And I think, I think the liberal justices are consciously trying to <laughs> work with the chief to not, uh, you know, if they can, if they can sign on and they can win some points for the next case, they're going to do it. And I think they're, uh, they have so little leverage with just three of them that they're going to have to do it in strategic moves like that. And, you know, I think that Justices Sotomayor, Kagan, and Jackson could say to themselves, we don't know how badly this might play out. And maybe it won't play out badly at all. So why why dare the chief and, you know, it, essentially in this case, it was the chief Barrett and Kavanaugh. Why not, you know, like show some unity here uh, at this point, given that it they could they would have been ha they were happy with the bottom line arrangement at this time that there was not any kind of real endorsement of where uh, Chief Justice Rehnquist was in Bush v. Gore. I do think there's good that this could well come back to bite them in a future case, but at least the yeah, most I, extreme theory was off the table. Yeah. And I think I read Moore versus Harper consistent with. Uh, what you mentioned earlier, the rejection in the Texas case um, coming from uh, uh, from uh, Attorney General Paxton of uh, of Texas, that the court was signaling we're not going to be, we may not be democracy uh, 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 expanding, but we're not going to be the tools to dismantle democracy either. Yeah, and can I just add something uh, to that? And I think I think we're seeing that more and more with certain. Um, Republican states with aggressive uh, attorneys general and the Fifth Circuit. There probably will be no reason for us to talk much about, if, if at all, about the Fifth Circuit here. But I think that, again, this this court has uh, put out a welcome mat for a certain kind of case, but you know, they're not, you know, they're not going to go as far as some of these attorneys general want them to go, uh, at least at this point. And certainly not as far as the Fifth Circuit is trying to get them to go either. Well, let's talk about another case out of the Fifth Circuit. And I said I was going to come back to it, which is the issue of, of free speech and free press. Um, and there's this new case that the Supreme Court agreed just on Tuesday, uh, or just, I guess last week, uh, uh, that they agreed to hear, which is this net choice case. Uh, or it's actually two cases, one out of right. one out of Texas, one out of Florida, on the question of uh, state laws that require social media companies to carry uh, content and not demote content, including content of politicians. And what I'm interested in is not the specifics of this case, it's still early, you may not have even looked at the briefs yet, but this weird juxtaposition of Justice Thomas and Justice Gorsuch potentially on the question of the First Amendment. So if you if you read Thomas, and I think Gorsuch is there too, in for campaign finance cases, you see this very libertarian view that, you know, money is speech, you shouldn't limit what people say, you even shouldn't require disclosure. And I, I want to talk about Justice Thomas's disclosures a little bit later on too. But, you know, when it comes to campaign finance, it, it should be an open free market, no limits, little disclosure. Uh, libertarian First Amendment, let the chips fall where they may. And yet Justice Thomas, you mentioned the the Berisha case and, and now this new case, uh, where Thomas says, you know, let's rethink libel law. But there's also in, in the earlier version of this uh, net choice case, Justice Thomas for, on the shadow docket writes this opinion that is anything but libertarian and essentially says social media companies can be told what content they must include or exclude. They're like common carriers. They're like Verizon can't deny you a cell phone because they don't like what you have to say. Same thing with these common carriers. It seemed like, you know, this is a lot of tension with press protective cases like the Tornillo case, where the court says you can't force a newspaper to print a reply to an editorial. Um, is this about partisan politics because conservatives don't like social media companies? Or how do we understand this flip on the First Amendment that seems to be coming from Justice Thomas and maybe others? Yeah, no, no, I think that is a dilemma. And it might be just, you know, how those two, those laws came about in Florida and Texas. You know, they, they were obviously aimed at content that 
uh, conservatives felt was being squelched. You know, it, it was, you know, election uh, deniers. It was, you know, the COVID, COVID precautions, Fauci stuff. I mean, it was, you know, ridiculous content that the, um, that the platforms that, you know, don't seem to be, you know, extra vigilant in taking down things. These were some extreme things. So I think there's definitely some tension there with, um, with Justice Thomas, but I have a feeling that, uh, you know, he's, he's mostly consistent in terms of what, what he wants to, uh, do on the First Amendment. Uh, although I was just, I was just about to uh, say something about how con- consistent he is on everything, but uh, uh, as as we're aware with Lo- the Loper Bright Chevron deference case, you know that is one where he he changed. So I don't know, Rick. I think we'll just have to see how that plays out. But either way, right now where uh, Justices Gorsuch and Thomas are uh, have been really the fringe, and on disclosure requirements uh, again, which you know. We will talk about probably in the context of ethics. I presume you might talk about there. Uh, you know, he he has been alone. He has been alone on that. Although less alone since the uh, Americans for Prosperity Foundation versus Bonta case issued at the same time that, as Brnovich. And that's uh, true. I'm sure you haven't seen this yet, but just yesterday, the Tenth Circuit issued an opinion striking down part mm-hmm. of a Wyoming campaign finance law, citing to Bonta and saying Bonta changed things, which is what I've been saying. It, it's just now making its way to the lower courts in terms oh. of. The, the campaign disclosure laws. I also think it's notable that the Supreme Court has not really taken on a major campaign finance limit case since the McCutcheon case, which I believe was 2015. It, it's it's remarkable because it's not for lack of trying. There have been a number of cases, for example, trying to get the other part of the McConnell case that was not overturned in Citizens United, right. turned on soft money. Um, what do you think explains the reluctance to go down that road? I mean, we could, if you, you know, if you took some of the theories that were advanced in Citizens United and McCutcheon, you could see a path to completely deregulating money in American politics. And yet, yet it's, I mean, it's, it's pretty highly deregulated now, given the loopholes, but it could just all be wiped out. And I, I'm wondering why you think the court's not taking more of these cases. I wonder about that. And for a while, I was wondering if in part it was because of, you know, the absence of Justice Kennedy, because he obviously had a, felt a real stake in that area of the law. But it might be it might be just kind of where we were at in 2020 and 2021 before we got our second big guns case is that neither side was exactly sure how far they were going to go. And, uh, you know, just did not know, um, could not count on, could not count on five for exactly what, uh, what they wanted to do and just thought they'd hold off. And that, that was the situation, for example, on the second amendment area that there was, uh, you would have thought there would have been a full majority to handle this, but it wasn't until we got the, uh, conservative super majority that they felt safe to even take it up. And then of course it was six, three and Bruin, but there could be something like that going on here. Now, now, Brett Kavanaugh on the D.C. Circuit, I, w- I wouldn't have thought he was so different than Justice Kennedy, but this was Justice Kennedy's area. So I don't have any strong theory on it, Rick, except for that. Well, I mean, Justice Kavanaugh has said things that make me think he's in line with Justice Kennedy, except he was also the one who, as a lower court judge, wrote the Blumen decision, which is the one that said that it doesn't violate the First Amendment to um, exclude foreign individuals from spending money in our elections. And that, yeah, that would struck me as, as, as intention with Citizens United. That was a decision that was summarily affirmed by the Supreme Court. They didn't even hear argument in it. They thought that Kavanaugh was clearly right. Uh, but I find yeah. that. No. So there's a lot of dimensions that probably individual justices have to accommodate in their head and, and to know about their colleagues. All right. So the last topic I want to turn to before I turn to audience questions, and, and let me remind you, if you have a question, you can put it in the Q&A box uh, mm-hmm. for Joan. Otherwise, I have plenty of questions to take us to the top of the hour. <laughs> I want to turn to a set of questions about the ethical dilemmas of the Supreme Court. So ethical dilemmas are not new. Um, I should have pulled down all your books, The Chief, and and uh, <laughs> now I'm now I want, I want to quote from American Original, your book on Justice Scalia. I mean, there there was controversy over Justice Scalia and recusal. Justice Scalia was kind of the uh, the the OG justice going on these um, hunting trips. Um, right. 
he actually <laughs> dies while on one of these trips. And uh, at one point, he's asked to recuse from a case involving Dick Cheney, who was then the vice president, who was a hunting partner. And, and Scalia writes this full-throated thing. It's like, we're all friends in Washington. If we had to uh, recuse every time one of our friends was before us, we'd be recusing all the time. And, you know, so, uh, so you know, th there have been ethical issues in the past, but I don't remember, at least in modern times, anything like what we see now. Uh, you know, the story after story, mostly involving Justice Thomas and Alito. Um, so maybe let, let's talk about um, Thomas first. Um, you know, what 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 have we learned about Justice Thomas's um, ethical questions? And, you know, where do things stand right now with him? I do notice that he he did recuse in a in a case related to uh, John Eastman, one of the lawyers for Trump during January 6th stuff. Yeah, and, and John Easton was a former clerk of his. So I think uh, I'm going to put that in the category of that. Uh, it was a John Eastman, it was a direct John Eastman dispute, a legal dispute. It's not that he was a lawyer on the case. He was a party to the case and he had been a clerk to uh, Justice Thomas. So I that's how I chalked that one up too. But it at least showed uh, an awareness of potential conflict of interest there. You know, I have known, I covered the Thomas hearings. I covered the Clarence Thomas hearing. So I've, I've been around a long time watching Justice Clarence Thomas. I've spent a lot of time talking to him over the years. Uh, I would have never guessed at how many trips and how lavish the trips were, you know? And I think that's what, you know, ProPublica has really let, gotten that. They have spent so much time, you know, getting the yacht manifest, talking to people who were at these fancy resorts, talking to people who did the fancy picture of Clarence Thomas and Harlan Crow and uh, Leonard Leo. And that's the other thing. It's not, this is, this is why I've actually thought that those stories were very worthwhile and they've been done by a very strong investigative team uh, that, you know, people who don't normally cover the court. And I think it's really good that they've come to this, this area and have decided to cover, you know, these justices as they would, you know, members of Congress. And because, because it seems like, you know, in this case, again, it's, you know, a billionaire, Harlan Crow, who's, who is, you know, invested in a lot of conservative causes. And here he is providing all these financial benefits to Clarence Thomas, including, you know, uh, a property deal with Clarence Thomas's family down in Georgia. And then, you know, Clarence Thomas had taken in um, a grandnephew to raise him and um, Harlan Crow had helped pay for the private tuition of this young man. And so there was, you know, all these benefits that uh, then uh, went unrecorded on his um, annual financial disclosure forms. So it, you know, it was surprising. Uh, Justice Thomas has since said, you know, he had said he said two different things. Uh, I, after the first reports, he said, I didn't think I needed to uh, report, quote, personal hospitality from a friend of mine, uh, you know, taking flying on the private jets, going on these super yachts. But, you know, I guess you could argue on whether that needed to be reported. I, I think that probably some of it did need to be reported. But also, I just think it's the judgment call. Just, you know, be upfront about this. So he, he has said... Um, he has said that for part of it. And then on some of the other reporting problems, he said through his lawyer most recently that any mistakes that were made were inadvertent. And again, that might be the case, but these these justices, the thing I always say whenever I talk about this on TV or write about it is, you know, they hold, they control so much of our lives. There are just nine of them. They're the, they are the end of the line for litigation. They control everything from, you know, like, reproductive rights to, you know, how a business is going to fare and, you know, large questions of speech and freedom and, you know, you name it, they are the final arbiters of it. And, you know, we want to have some, you know, this court is already at the lowest it's ever been since Gallup and other pollsters have started, have started doing public approval ratings. It's at the lowest and, you know, do some things to try to, you know, reinstill some confidence in, in what you do. So what will they do? You know, the chief uh, has changed his mind on this whole formal ethics code thing. He used to be completely against it, thinking, you know, look, we follow we follow um, on our own voluntarily what lower court judges are bound by. You know, we are 
you know, we're ethical, we trust each other, we're not going to second guess each other. But I think he's come around now to the idea that they need to, they need to uh, say something that's not just lip service about what they do, that they should do something formal. Now, I don't, you know, as it stands from my reporting, he doesn't have unanim unanimity. I think he could get a majority, but probably enough of them think, oh, this will blow over. Uh, you know, I think the people who are, the justices inside who are resisting it think, you know, this is gonna blow over or, or no matter what we do, it will not satisfy people. So why even do anything? So I think there's some real tension. We've seen justices Kavanaugh and Kagan go public about you know how they hope something is done, but those are the only two have been, who have been public about it. The chief uh, last May to the American Law Institute, I think that was the audience he was speaking to, you know, said that we are mindful of this and we want to restore some confidence, but um, uh, he wanted to say that we're taking, seri taking it seriously, that, but that was May and here we are in October. I, I, I think your point uh, is especially well taken about how much power the court has. And yeah. I would add to that, how unforgiving they are when uh, you know a a, <laughs> know. a a you know a death penalty litigant is three days yeah, late. Uh, it's like sorry, got to follow the rules. And here it is, you know, uh, it's kind of oopsie. Uh, you'd think they that they would be getting advice that they're taking a trip around the world or you know taking tuition for their uh, relative or engaged in a land sale uh, with uh, with someone that does not seem to be like an arm's length transaction. Um, so it's a little odd. Um, let's talk about Alito. And I don't know what you can tell me in terms of your reporting, but I'm more and more, my personal opinion, more and more believe that it was Alito that was the leaker of the early version of the Dobbs opinion, because I just now see, I was just going back, I can't remember what I was researching, but for years, the Wall Street Journal editorial page has been channeling Justice Alito. And, you know, like we think Justice Alito might think this. And and then, of course, in the last year, Alito, when he's facing these um, claims of, you know, his own failure to uh, disclose a, a, a fishing trip to Alaska, for example, he does interviews with the Wall Street Journal editorial page uh, and that they get transcribed. He, he even writes an op ed directly trying to pre butt the ProPublica thing. And I'm just kind of wondering, you know, what's going on with Justice Alito? This seems to me, Justice Thomas seems contrite is not the word, but he's he's at least, you know, by his filings and his statement that things were inadvertent, seems to be admitting there are rules that apply to him. Uh, whereas Alito is saying, not only are there no rules, I don't think Congress even has the power to have rules uh, over me. So where do you put Alito in all of this? Well, I put Alito very much uh, with pals with the Wall Street Journal editorial page for many, many years. You refer to uh, that editorial that ran uh, the last week in April of 2022 before the huge Dobbs leak on May 2nd of 2022, where just to remind everyone, the Wall Street Journal runs an editorial that I followed up on to find out was absolutely accurate. Uh, and, you know, before the Dobbs leak actually happened, that said that, you know, uh, the, there was a majority to reverse Roe v. Wade. It's likely that Sam Alito had the opinion. And there was some concern raised on the part of the um, editorial page editors that John Roberts was trying to lobby his colleagues to pick off Kavanaugh and maybe Barrett, mostly Kavanaugh. Well, that was exactly what was happening. And I'm going to take you back even further to 20. 20. No, it was late 2019, I think, when this report came out. Bostock. Do you remember what the Wall Street Journal wrote about Bostock? Same editorial page wrote saying it looks like, um, oh, yeah, it was, it, was, <laughs> it was so great. It was uh, it was sort of blaming Kagan for a new brand of textualism that could possibly woo um, Neil Gorsuch on uh, the Title VII question in Bostock. And you know, again, just to remind folks, that was the question of whether um, uh, Title VII's pr prohibition on sex discrimination would extend to uh, sexual orientation and gender identity. Neil Gorsuch, in fact, and this was true also, in fact, and I, I reported this out extensively at the end of that term, Neil Gorsuch had very early settled on the idea of a textualist reading of Title VII and was writing an opinion 
that favored the, the challengers to these businesses that had excluded them based on their sexual orientation and gen, uh, uh, gender identity. And um, uh, but the Wall Street Journal editorial then was complaining about, you know, could Neil Gorsuch's head have been turned for this kind of textualism? Well, you know, I have never, you know, it's not like I'm going to go to the the Wall Street Journal editorial page editors or to uh, Samuel Alito directly on this question and say, hey, have you been feeding them information all along? But like, it certainly looks like that because the Wall Street Journal has been getting information. And I, what I've always said was that there has always been a closeness. I've, I've already, I've been, I, I know a lot about what's happened behind the scenes, but I've been very cagey in what I've said in print myself. And what I typically say is that there has been a channel, <laughs> there has been a channel between the uh, the justices on the right side of the court and and that page. And sometimes there's an intermediary uh, that lots of people could guess at, but sometimes there might be an intermediary or two who passes on information. But just as Alito, by virtue of then, you know, having this kind of paleship thing going with the editorial page to defend himself in advance of that one ProPublica piece, and then to uh, write in, in that op-ed that you referred to, Rick, and then also to do the Q&A with David Rifkin and uh, James Toronto, I believe it was. You know, it just shows the kind of a coziness, which is, you know, look, look, I'm in favor of anybody being cozy with a newspaper person. Um, I'd like it to be me, but, uh, you know, He's he's entitled to do that, but it does show that he might have been uh, he might have been the source of the that earlier information. If he was, I mean, then the kind of statements he made after the Dobbs leak of expressing outrage would be all that more outrageous. Um, but of course, we you know we don't know until someone uh, breaks that story or until Josh Gerstein decides to tell us, which I don't expect him <laughs> to. We're not going to know uh, the source of that uh, of that. No, topic. no. All right, um, we're coming to the end. I want to ask you a, kind of a broader, we started with a global question about the sure. Supreme Court's democracy cases. I want to ask you a broader question about the Supreme Court's role in democracy. When you think about most of the hot button issues in American politics, say, let's put aside foreign policy, which uh, I think is somewhat different. But you think about guns, abortion, immigration, the power of the regulatory state, we give so much power to these justices to decide these cases. And um, you say public opinion is cratering on the court. I'm, some of that, I think, is probably the ethical questions. But some of it is, I think, that some of these opinions are out of line with public opinion uh, on the merits, on the question of abortion rights, for example. Um, Dobbs is not very popular. Uh, I don't think that the court's uh, expanding view of gun rights is very popular in a society where we have a major problem with uh, mass shootings. So um, how much, so here's the meta question, how much do you think the court is and how much should it be taking into account public opinion as it is you know, serving as uh, what I think just Judge Learned Hand called a the mighty platonic guardians of American uh, of, of the American public, you know, that these justices are, we give them so much power, uh, are they exercising it responsibly? You know, and I think their power has only grown for a couple different reasons. And one would be that, you know, the political branches have not, uh, you know, notably Congress is not able to do really anything you know, right now, obviously it definitely can't because it doesn't have a speaker, but uh, you know, it's, when, you know, back in the day, Justice Scalia, who you and I both studied, used to say, well, if Congress doesn't like it, it can change it. Well, back in the day, Congress probably couldn't change it then. Um, you know, the last, you know, they did Lily Ledbetter, you know, in what was, two, what was it, like 2007, 8, 9, right in there. They did, you know, a, a civil rights uh, set of amendments back in 91, 92. But, you know, Congress isn't, Congress usually isn't responding to the court. And right now it's so gridlocked, it can't. So the court, the court's authority in um, our, our system of government has, has only grown just because of how polarized we are now. And some of the justices refer to that. Some of the justices refer to that, but I have to say they're the ones on the left. You know, I, I read in the beginning that, that quote from Kagan in the partisan gerrymandering case. 
But then I was thinking also, there was something that was really interesting in the courtroom uh, when the justices were reading their decisions in 303 Creative, the, uh, the religious liberty LGBTQ case. And Justice Gorsuch had, you know, seen it completely through the lens of discrimination against this woman who wanted to do a, a wedding website and wanted to exclude same-sex couples. And then, you know, just as Sotomayor starts reading her dissent from the bench about, you know, seeing this, you know, likening it to uh, actions in the 1960s that discriminated against people based on race. And one thing she said was, you know, when you think of what's going on in this day and age, how much discrimination we're now seeing you know, kind of this reemergence against people, trans people, and just, you know, LGBTQ folks in so many ways, you know, I don't know if she, she didn't say Florida, I don't know if she was thinking of Florida, I don't know what she was thinking, but she was, you know, taking account of the larger political cultural world that the Supreme Court fits into, and what kind of signal it's sending. And, you know, to take us back to the very top, and your very first reference to Shelby County, when Chief Justice John Roberts says things have changed, things have changed in the South, things have changed in America, he sends a signal and you know it, it becomes it becomes easy for the political players to pick up on that or or in the case of um, in situations involving discrimination, as Justice Sotomayor was talking about, this court sets a tone. It sets a tone whether it likes it or not. And I think that um, some justices are mindful of that role, and some would rather say, oh, no, it's not us, even though it really is them. Oh. It, it wouldn't be a Zoom conversation unless someone forgot to unmute. So I say, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll have to leave it there. Um, great conversation. And uh, if you want to know more with insights that you really will not find anywhere else. I, I can't recommend this enough. Uh, I just reread it uh, in preparation for uh, our talk today and uh, enjoyed going through it a second time. Nine Black Robes. Uh, this is uh, how the really how the Trump justices and the supermajority of the Supreme Court has changed what the Supreme Court is doing. Uh, urge you to pick it up. Uh, thanks so much, Joan, and hopefully we'll have you back again soon. Thanks, Rick. Best of luck to you. I enjoyed it. Take care, everyone. Bye-bye.